who have missed today's session, uh, they will be able to uh, to take a short quiz um, and complete the session. Um, as people filter in, I'm just going to give an introduction and describe what's what's going to occur to, in today's session. Um, I think it's somewhat appropriate that uh, you are attending a series of webinars on historic properties because I believe that everybody here is uh, here for an historic occasion. Um, as Pacific Union agents, you are the first group to take part in our real estate certification program. Though this may be your first foray into formal historic preservation training, we hope it inspires you to become a member of our organization by visiting CaliforniaPreservation.org. Today's session will first look at different levels um, of designation in San Francisco. We will follow that with a presentation of state level and national designations and their impact on the value, marketability, and tax benefits of historic properties. You will learn why knowing a property's designation is important for agents, how to determine whether a resource is listed as a local, state, or national resource, how to determine if a property is contributing to a designated district, how to examine historic properties in San Francisco using the planning department's mapping applications, the differences and implications of locally designated historic properties, including Article 10 and Article 11 resources in San Francisco. And the session's format will consist of two presentations, together totaling over an hour in length. We will close with a 15-minute question and answer period. <clears throat> you may be polled from time, to, uh, from time to time, so don't be alarmed if it covers your screen. It will only briefly appear during polling and then disappear when the presentation resumes. There is a Q&A box. Um, I'm sorry, there's a comment box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Um, if you have a comment, a question, or if you experience any te uh, technical difficulties, don't hesitate to type into the chat box. Um, if you are connected to a mobile device using uh, the Adobe Connect mobile app, certain interactive features may not be available to you, but you should still be able to watch and listen to the presentation. If you are attached to a microphone, you should grant Adobe Connect voice access to your microphone when asked to do so. Um, I'll, I'll briefly explain how to do that in a minute here. Uh, your voice will be muted during most of the presentation, but you may raise your hand by, by clicking on the hand symbol at the top of the screen. Once your hand is raised, we will grant you voice access. This will allow you to have a short dialogue with the speakers or ask a question in person. If for some reason your sound does not work, you will need to type in your question in the chat box. First, I'm going to introduce today's speakers. Mary Brown has worked as a preservation planner for the San Francisco Planning Department for the past six years. She manages the landmark designation work program and has worked on several large-scale historic resource surveys, including the Sunset District Housing Tracts Survey, and she is currently working on a historic context statement and historic resource survey focused on the neighbor, on neighborhood commercial buildings. William Berg is a state historian for the California Office of Historic Preservation. He was born in Skokie, Illinois, and grew up in Sacramento suburbs, attending Humboldt State University and eventually earning an MA from Sacramento State University's public history program. Mr. Berg, uh, Mr. Berg has authored five books about Sacramento history. As president of the Sacramento Old City Association, he advocates for the protection of Sacramento's irreplaceable historic resources. At this point, I'm going to mute any attendees who have joined in on the session, so don't be alarmed if your phone presents you with a message. Hear me? Uh, I haven't started the presentation yet. This is the first slide, but I wanted to welcome you, and I hope this is informative. It was good to see uh, the responses to that poll, and I will try to address uh, the issue of limitations um, during this presentation, and I know uh, it will also be addressed in future webinars on this topic. So I will get started. I want to provide a quick overview on what I'll be talking about in this portion of the presentation today. 
going to take a, a look at Article 10 uh, landmarks and landmark districts. These are the local designations as opposed to national register designations. Uh, I'll also look at the Article 11 buildings and conservation districts and how they differ between these two articles of the planning code. I'll, I'll go over briefly the review process for alterations uh, to historic buildings, uh, talk about historic resource surveys and the other type of building evaluations that are not Article 10 or Article 11. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon the California Environmental Quality Act which is CEQA and how it re relates to historic buildings, particularly the review of alterations to historic buildings. And I'll also show a series of, of maps. I have four maps that I'm going to dive into during this presentation uh, to show you how to find information about a building's historic status, uh, what type of district it is in, uh, if it's a contributor or not a contributor, and, and show some examples of the survey products and how they've changed over time. So I'll start with the Article 10 landmarks and landmark districts. Uh, these were codified as part of Article 10 of the Planning Code, and the graphic to the right is a screenshot of the Planning Department's homepage. And the entire planning code is available online uh, on the top right. I've circled it. If it's a future point you're interested in learning more about the details of what Article 10 uh, does or does not require, this is a great spot to go. Article 10 was uh, codified, introduced in 1967. So it's over 40 years old. Uh, the first landmark was the Mission Dolores uh, Church, uh, which was designated in the late 1960s. And the most recent landmark was designated last month, and that was a bookstore associated with African American history, which is the Marcus Books Jim Mose Bob City building. There are uh, roughly 1,500 properties that are covered by Article 10. Uh, some of these are individual landmarks. Just 265 individual landmarks have been designated in the past 40 years, uh, and 13 landmark districts. And there's about 1,200 properties included in these landmark districts. So it's a relatively small number of properties. And there's roughly uh, 150,000 buildings in San Francisco. So if 1,500 uh, are landmark, that's about 1% of the total building stock. Uh, but these buildings are, there's, it covers a wide range of property types for landmarks, uh, ranging from religious buildings, which were uh, very often designated in the early years of designation, uh, dozens of church, a couple synagogues, there's parks, uh, including Washington Square Park, a portion of Golden Gate Park, uh, different bridges, including the Golden Gate Bridge as a landmark, an individual landmark, uh, libraries, particularly the Carnegie Libraries, which were built uh, with Andrew Carnegie's funds in the in 1910s. Many of those libraries have been designated. Other institutional buildings like fire stations are uh, were built at the same time, and those are also commonly designated. But the bulk of the designations really are focused on residential and commercial buildings, and these are primarily single-family houses, uh, often larger uh, size single-family houses. And I'll, I'll go into a few examples in the next couple slides. And finally, uh, landmarks can be designated in landmark districts for their association with people or cultural events. And there's a few examples that I'll highlight. This is a map of the uh, existing uh, Article 10 landmarks and what we're calling uh, landmark districts. And as you can see, they are clustered in the central and uh, northern portion of the city. Very few landmarks uh, on the margins of the city, uh, just a handful in all of Bayview, Hunters Point, Viz Valley, Excelsior, another handful in the Sunset District, and up in the Richmond District. So what we're, we're looking at is over time the, the focus was on architecturally lavish buildings, which uh, would be found in the upper income enclaves of Pacific Heights, um, Russian Hill, Knob Hill, and that's where the majority of the landmarks and landmark districts are. So I'll give a few examples. 
Uh, and these are the, the early landmark focus was uh, the mansions, um, architect design buildings uh, like the Roos House, which is on the right, designed by Bernard Maybach. There are several of his buildings represented. And very strong architectural expression, often uh, much larger buildings, and particularly single family houses. It's a flood mansion to the left as well. Red landmarks are also uh, given status to the smaller buildings. So on the left, we have the Tanfran cottages, which are very small uh, cottages near Mission Dolores. And these uh, date back to the early 1850s, just read, uh, during or um, at the end of the gold rush era. And the 900, 900 Innes Street on the right, which is in the Bayview area, which was a shipwright's cottage and is the last remaining example of uh, a building associated with what was a thriving um, shipbuilding industry in this area. It's also obviously very small, and, and it's not in good condition right, right now. Uh, there are uh, many good examples of smaller scale uh, landmark buildings. This is the Filbert Street Cottages, which was associated with uh, an important artist uh, who worked at the nearby Art Institute. Many of her artist uh, friends and students also resided in these cottages, which were built in 1907, and have a, a strong association with the art artistic tradition in San Francisco. And uh, they've been vacant for a while. They were designated over 10 years ago. Uh, but I wanted to uh, show this slide because these uh, buildings. There is a, a plan for rehabilitation that was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission several years ago. Developers are working on getting other uh, building department entitlements. But there is a plan to create a large uh, one-story addition spanning the length of this uh, rear yard of this uh, lot, as well as an underground uh, parking structure and a general re rehabilitation. So. From what I've heard, that is going to be moving forward uh, shortly. And I just wanted to highlight that it is possible to create additions uh, even on smaller scale landmark uh, structures and buildings. And this is a series of four little cottages on one unusually configured lot. The Nightingale House, this is close to Hayes Valley. This also uh, is, I think they're wrapping up their uh, rehabilitation. I wanted to highlight this building. Um, it was a gorgeous building, Victorian era building, very unusual. And they took advantage of the Mills Act contract, which they entered into with the city, uh, which resulted in a substantial savings in property taxes in exchange for this contract and agreeing to uh, a certain maintenance program and um, rehabilitation of the building. So. I'm not going to talk very much about the Mills Act today. I just wanted to bring it up as an important tax incentive. It applies to buildings that are listed locally as an Article 10 landmark or in an Article 10 landmark district, as well as properties on the National Register. Uh, but it's, an, it's historically been an underused uh, preservation incentive, but more Mills Act contracts are, are coming in. And there was a recent uh, program to, to streamline the process and make it um, less expensive and um, time consuming to apply in order to encourage a more land, uh, Mills Act application. So that, that is coming into fruition. And we had a, about 15 last year, and I think around five more applications this year. And I had mentioned cultural associations. I wanted to show two landmarks, which are uh, designated due to their uh, cultural associations. The left is the Harvey Milk Camera Shop. Uh, he resided upstairs. It's the first uh, building in the country that was designated due to an association with uh, lesbian and gay history. Uh, and to the right is the most recent landmark, which I mentioned earlier, which is uh, the Marcus Books Jimbo's Bob City Building, which was uh, designated due to its association with historic businesses, uh, Jimbo's Bob City, which was a progressive Jazz Club, uh, which was in the basement, and also Marcus Books, which was a very influential African-American uh, bookstore, which operated out of the uh, space uh, from the 18, uh, sorry, <laughs> not 18, uh, from uh, the mid uh, 20th century until very recently. 
So also I mentioned there were landmark districts. There's 13 landmark districts. Uh, and these are collections of properties that are significant for, again, architectural expression, uh, historical importance, histor or, or cultural importance. Uh, these, the largest districts are uh, primarily residential, primarily single family houses, uh, and nearly 300 buildings in the Liberty Hill district. Uh, but the, the size of the landmark districts varies tremendously, and we have a few districts with under 10 properties. Uh, I have a couple of photos here. The top one is uh, the Painted Ladies, um, an iconic Alamo Square uh, landmark district, which is a very large district as well, almost 300 properties. And the bottom photograph uh, shows working men's cottages. They're very tiny cottages, and those are in the Dog Patch landmark district. So the variety of buildings uh, changes um, quite a bit in terms of uh, the scale or whether it's a vernacular building or a high style uh, Victorian style building or a brick warehouse. There's many um, factory buildings and uh, brick warehouse buildings, particularly in Jackson Square and in the uh, waterfront area districts. And I just noticed a, a comment from a Barbara Dunlap that I haven't looked at these comments yet, but to talk a bit more clearly and louder. So I'm going to adjust my headset a little bit, and hopefully the sound will come through. So I'm going to take you to the first map. Uh, this is a, the landmarks map that shows all of the landmarks and landmark districts in San Francisco. And it's an interactive map, and I'm going to show you what kind of information you can find here. So if, uh, John, could you share the screen? And I I think you guys might have a blank screen, but I am going to set it up. Just be a moment. OK. OK, Mary, we see your screen now. Excellent. So this is the Landmarks Google map. and. Uh, you could type in an address or zoom in, and I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, the icons show the landmarks. I'll click on one. This is a recent landmark. It's the Dolger Building on Judah Street in the Sunset District. Uh, it was designed by uh, Charles Clausen in the 1930s, and it was the sales office for Henry Dolger, who was a prolific builder uh, in the Sunset District and also a, a real estate agent um, combined. So to show you what's inside, there's generally a photo of the building. Uh, there's the landmark designation report. And I think it'd be interesting, uh, just going forward, if you wanted to familiarize yourself with what's in these reports, uh, what they do or don't contain. Uh, and I'll just scroll through, sorry, very briefly. There's a couple pages I wanted to show. The beginning is the ordinance. So this is the official uh, legislation designating and uh, describes what is included or not included in the designation. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit to an important part of the report that you, oops, different page. This is a section of the report that contains information about what of the physical features are covered by the landmark designation. And, and it's very specific. It uh, typically applies just to the exterior of buildings. Uh, rarely is the interior uh, designated. And the interiors are typically just designated for uh, non-residential buildings, often just a lobby area or a publicly accessible area, like a a theater or an auditorium. So this is the area to look to see what exactly is covered and what would require review by the Historic Preservation Commission if there were plans to alter or rehabilitate. And I'll go back up. There's also, you can see this is a big document, but it's it provides information about the history of the building, the, the historic context 
of the area, of the architect, of the intention of why that building was constructed, uh, what its character-defining features are, its significance and period of significance. So these are some of the terms that are useful to familiarize yourself when, when discussing historic properties. And John, uh, I am ready to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So common issues and questions about landmarks. Uh, Again, residential interiors are typically not covered, uh, but in order to find out exactly what is covered for specific buildings, checking the designation ordinance that I just showed is important, and these features will be listed. Uh, but occasionally, interiors are covered, and it's good to know that up front. Another important issue is uh, the use of a building or a tenancy of a building. And landmark designation, nor does the National Register designation, impact in any way how a building is used or who the commercial or resi residential tenant is. And sometimes designation is, is used to try to save a property or try to save a business, but ultimately that's not the goal of landmark designation. It's really to protect the physical fabric. And so those attempts um, are, are not successful in terms of uh, impacting the tenancy or use. Also, the owner consent uh, is not required for local designation. There often is owner consent, uh, but the Board of Supervisors and the mayor can, can vote and adopt this, uh, an Article 10 landmark building uh, without owner's consent. But that's fairly uncommon. And also, I see that there are comments going on in the chat box to the right. And just to let you know that I am not looking at those right now, but I am assuming that John is going to compile some questions that I can address later in the question and answer period. That's right, Mary. I, I'm collecting all the questions right now. Okay, terrific. So this is a, this comes to the issue of uh, limitations on what you can do with a, a historic building. This is specifically for landmarks and landmark districts. There is a, a specific entitlement that's required just for landmarks and landmark districts that would not be required for a National Register or California Register property, for example. And this requirement comes in the form of what's called a Certificate of Appropriateness, or what we refer to as a CFA. These are considered and granted at a Historic Preservation Commission hearing, and they uh, any alteration that requires a building permit if it's not specifically exempted, would require a certificate of appropriateness from the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, and a few examples, the biggest one is demolition. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission would need to grant a C of A in order for a demolition to go forward. And that's uh, honestly fairly rare. It's happened a few times that I'm aware of. Uh, but they are um, definitely are looking for alternatives to demolition. And by uh, granting landmark status, there's an extra layer, not an absolute prohibition on demolition, but there's an extra layer uh, of a hold on review time of a demolition permit in order to explore other options. Also, a new construction within a landmark district, uh, let's say there's a vacant lot or a property has been destroyed, uh, a permit for a new construction would also require a C of A at the Historic Preservation Commission. And the purpose of this is to ensure that new construction is compatible with the character-defining features of the landmark district. Also, major exterior alterations, um, like an addition or the insertion of a garage, uh, those would require a C of A. And those, those definitely happen. Um, landmarks are not fixed uh, in time. Uh, property owners are not required to rehabilitate their building or to improve their building if they own a landmark beyond regular planning code requirements. But uh, these exterior alterations are reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission. And there are frequently garages added. There are additions um, added to landmark buildings. And if you're interested, you could look at the planning department um, homepage uh, at the Historic Preservation Commission hearings, and you can look through the agenda packets to see what kind of alterations have been approved recently by the Historic Preservation Commission uh, and see that there are frequently changes that are happening. 
Also, recently, the, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, delegated some authority in approving the smaller scale works uh, alterations to planning department staff. And this is called an administrative certificate of appropriateness. It's an application that can be approved by planning department staff. And it, the benefit is it does not require a Historic Preservation Commission hearing. And it only covers uh, the smaller scopes of works that are, that are clearly laid out in Article 10. Uh, and examples of this are in-kind window replacement, um, solar panels, skylights, new signs, replacement of non-historic storefront features. So this is a, a, a new process. It's about a, a maybe year and a half old. And it's able to speed up the review. Uh, it generally just takes a week or so for planning department staff to uh, review and approve the projects. And uh, there is a future webinar. My colleague, Tim Fry, who is a preservation coordinator, he will be presenting um, design guidelines for historic buildings. Uh, and he'll talk more about the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which are the standards the planning department uh, uses to, uh, to guide the review of alterations to historic buildings. So it's a complicated issue. And I know there's a lot of information <laughs> about the, the types of, of review process we're looking at here. Uh, but it will be covered in more depth on what it would mean to add a garage or, or what, what would the, the design guidelines look towards for um, adding an addition to the property. Uh, so the landmark designation and work program is active right now. We have 16 properties on the work program. The Historic Preservation Commission is interested in broadening the geographic diversity of landmarks. So uh, they've prioritized buildings that are on the periphery of San Francisco, several in the Sunset District and the Bayview uh, Mission District. And they've also, they're also interested in landmarking uh, uh, modern buildings, uh, which there's very few modern landmarks right now. So I just I wanted to show a few photos of residential buildings and uh, that are, uh, will be considered soon uh, for landmark designation. There's the Russell House. Uh, designed by the modernist uh, master architect Eric Mendelssohn. It's his only extant example of work in San Francisco. There's the Moro uh, in Moro, the Cowl House, uh, designed by the uh, the man who designed the architectural components of the Golden Gate Bridge. That's in the center. It's in Forest Hill. And to the right is a small scale early example by William Worcester of the Second Bay tradition, and that is on Clay Street. Uh, as I mentioned, it's an active program. And we have, uh, since 2011, we've designated five new landmarks. I mean, it's definitely a slow process. And two new landmark districts for a total of about 100 new buildings covered by Article 10. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention Article 11 buildings. Uh, these are also uh, codified by the planning code. They were evaluated as part of the downtown plan in 1985. There was a large scale survey of the commercial buildings downtown. Uh, the difference between Article 10 and Article 11 is Article 11 is focused only in the downtown area. And the, the designations are based on architectural merit only. Uh, it does not consider cultural or historic association. So it's looking at the architecture. These are often, uh, there's, there's a good number of smaller scale brick buildings, two or three stories, um, dating to the reconstruction era after the 1906 earthquake. Uh, more monumental works, uh, banks, uh, larger, um, the, the first wave of high rise office buildings uh, that went in in the 1910s and 20s. Uh, and a, a great benefit for uh, Article 11 buildings is the potential for the transfer of development rights. So smaller buildings could sell their developable um, rights to another entity and make some money uh, in exchange for uh, retaining their small scale building. Uh, these are also like Article 10. There's individual Article 11 buildings. And there are also uh, districts. And these are called conservation districts. And there's six conservation districts in San Francisco. I, I won't get into the review process other than to say it's very similar to the Article 10 uh, Certificate of Appropriateness, uh, but it's called a, a permit to alter 
rather than a C of A. And these are heard, major projects are heard at the HPC, or there's a minor permit to alter uh, option for smaller changes uh, in the same way that there's the administrative certificate of appropriateness. So since my understanding is that uh, the audience that I'm speaking to now is not focused on downtown buildings, more residential, and this is the last I'm going to talk about, Article 11. Uh, but as I mentioned, these are 1 to 2 percent of the total number of buildings in San Francisco are covered by Article 10 or Article 11. And clearly, San Francisco has many uh, wonderful buildings. And many of these, most of these buildings have not uh, been surveyed at all. or They're not designated. They haven't been surveyed. And so it's not known whether or not these buildings are uh, potential historic resources. So for the past 40 years uh, in San Francisco, there have been historic resource surveys conducted. And the first survey was uh, conducted by the Junior League in 1968 in a survey called Here Today. I'll mention it later. Uh, and in the, in the subsequent decades, uh, many more efforts to identify and document historic buildings. And the purpose is it's a planning tool uh, these days to identify buildings uh, prior to changes in, in, in an area zoning. Uh, and also to, de to determine whether or not a building is eligible for listing in the Article 10 or in the National Register or the California Register. Uh, there's one thing I, I do want to make clear is that uh, if, a, if a building is surveyed or included in a, in a survey area, it's not considered a formal designation. It's really looking at whether a property would uh, be eligible or appears eligible as a language for listing, but it's not an actual listing, but it's good to keep in mind. Uh, and this, this eligibility is important when we're uh, reviewing projects uh, using CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and this is a state mandated review for alterations of buildings that are over 50 years old. It's an environmental evaluation, which I'll uh, speak briefly about and show some examples uh, in a few minutes. So some of the benefits of a survey is uh, it provides property owners and uh, community upfront information about whether a building is a resource or not a resource. It also saves property owners money to have had their building surveyed because they they know if it's a resource or not a resource. And if they want to uh, pursue alterations in the future, they won't have to pay for uh, this first phase of determining whether or not it's a resource. And I know this is complicated, and it's a fairly short webinar, uh, but I just want to get these um, ideas out there. And uh, you can ask questions at the end or contact the planning department in the future if you want more follow-up. So numerous uh, surveys have, been, have recently uh, been completed, um, many in association with various areas plan area plans, Mission, Soma, uh, Japantown. And I want to give a quick example of a historic resource survey. Uh, this is Showplace Square. This was adopted a few years ago. And John, if you could uh, shoot us over to the excellent. I'm going to connect. OK, this is the uh, survey results for the Showplace Square Historic Resource Survey. You can Google that, or it's on the planning department uh, web pages. And I want to just show you how some of the survey products have evolved over time. This is a map of the survey area. And John, can you see my icon right now, my mouse tool? OK. So uh, there's a legend here. It shows what's a historic resource, what hasn't been evaluated, what's not a historic resource. And I'm just going to quickly show you. Uh, so this red is a boundary of a historic district that was identified in the survey. I'll click on it. Uh, and this shows it's a heavy timber and steel uh, warehouse uh, factory district. And I'll open up what the documentation is. This is the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. It's a state survey form, and it's a district record. And it's 15 pages, and it provides information about the historic context, why it's significant, what the integrity, what types of buildings are 
uh, included in the district. So I'll go back and show you the individual buildings are also documented on these forms. And I just clicked on one randomly. Let me see if I can hide this. Let me click on another one randomly. And each of the individual buildings within the district is also documented on what's called a primary record force form, which is we call a DPRA form. So if you're uh, poking around in the online database, you'll see these forms. Um, this is the purpose of them uh, to identify and document buildings and also districts. And there's quite a bit of information in there. And it, it provide better understanding of whether, I mean, certainty and whether the building is considered a historic resource or not a resource. So John, could we go back to the uh, presentation? Okay, it looks like it's loading. So the DPR forms uh, were standard about 10 years ago. We, they were used for all surveys. Uh, there has been some evolution in the types of forms and documentation that we're using uh, for surveys right now. And I want to show you a quick example of a recently adopted survey of tract houses in the Sunset District. And because these buildings are, we were looking at uh, buildings constructed between 1925 and 1950. In the Sunset District, single-family houses, they're very similar. Uh, and we were able to conduct the survey on a spreadsheet rather than on these fairly time-intensive uh, DPRA or B forms. So John, if we could move to the uh, share screen, I'll quickly show what these look like. And for participants, it will. Uh, Definitely uh, look around in the Planning Department web, uh, website, and there are several examples of connect of these different types of surveys. So this is the Sunset District. Uh, again, there's a searchable map to look at the survey findings, and I'll. The survey area, the different colors indicate districts. Uh, you need to zoom in a bit to indicate the individual properties, but I will pull up one. This is a, the Rivera Heights uh, identified eligible district. Um, this is basic information that would show up. And one can download the historic district summary which provides information about the boundaries for the district, what's a contributor or not a contributor, um, period of significance, what the eligibility uh, and the significance and integrity discussion, and some interesting, also interesting historical information about the area and why it was considered a historic district and that justification. And finally, I mentioned before the importance of character defining features, but there's a list of character defining features for the build, for specific buildings and also for uh, the district as a whole. And then all of the properties are included as well. So John, if we could go back to the PowerPoint. So the survey findings uh, are inform review, uh, CEQA environmental review. Again, this is state mandated environmental review only of buildings, um, uh, proposed alterations to buildings. Uh, and again, it's only the exterior buildings. It does not imply to, uh, apply to the interior. So bathroom remodels, kitchen remodels are, are definitely not, uh, do not require or trigger a CEQA environmental review. It does apply, however, to all buildings in San Francisco or over 45 years old. And, and frankly, that's really most buildings in San Francisco. 
planning department, in order to identify uh, the different types of buildings, has created CEQA categories of A, B, and C, and those are automatically uh, defaulted in our database, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so there's three types of CEQA categories in San Francisco. There's known historic resources, potential historic resources, and then also buildings that are identified as not a historic resource. It'll show some quick examples of what the category A, the known resources, everything that's in Article 10, landmark or landmark district, is, is automatically defaulted as a known resource. Uh, everything in Article 11, uh, conservation district or building, is a known resource. Everything on the national listed, formally listed on the National and California Register, is categorized as a known resource. Properties that are included in uh, adopted surveys that are identified eligible for listing are also categorized automatically as a known resource. Uh, this is not every survey in San Francisco. Uh, it's specific surveys that are listed. Uh, they include the Here Today survey, which was conducted uh, in 1968. So every property in a book called Here Today, and I have a, a screenshot of it here, is considered um, a known, uh, known resource. Uh, all the HPC adopted surveys uh, are known resources. And federal projects uh, for federally funded large-scale um, projects involving federal funds, they also conduct surveys, which I, uh, Jay, or sorry, uh, William will speak about. Uh, so moving into potential resources. And most uh, properties in the city are considered uh, potential resources, are categorized. Uh, every property over 45 years, uh, constructed over 45 years ago, and that has not been formally evaluated, uh, is automatically lumped into uh, the category B, potential resource. Uh, and this includes the 1976 architectural survey. There's, I have a field form uh, shown here. This is 10,000 buildings were included in the survey in 1976. Uh, but it was never formally adopted, and so these properties are not considered known historic resources. They're still in the potential category. Give some quick examples. Some of uh, some fabulous buildings, and most fabulous <laughs> buildings in San Francisco are still considered uh, category B potential resources. Building on the left is one of uh, Richard Neutra's uh, early designs. He only has uh, three extant buildings in San Francisco. It's never been formally evaluated, so it's still considered just a, a potential resource. Building on the right, an excellent example of a, a Tudor-inspired building, also never evaluated. Uh, some are familiar with this building. It was the, the site of the decorator show place uh, a few years ago. Again, has never been evaluated. It clearly has um, strong architectural expression, but it's still just a uh, potential resource. Uh, again, um, this runs the gamut, uh, working, working class cottages, um, early turn of the century, the historic status is not known, uh, as well as most tract houses constructed in the 30s and 40s. They're over 45 years old. They're, uh, they've never been surveyed. Uh, they're still a Category B potential resource. And a small number of buildings in the city are considered Category C, which is not a resource, and that uh, place of properties were constructed uh, fewer than 45 years ago uh, or were evaluated in a survey and determined not to be a historic resource. This is an example of a, a Victorian-era cottage that was later altered to such a degree that it lost its physical integrity and can no longer uh, convey its significance and is not a resource. And I'm, I'm going to wrap up with this uh, property information map, which is the main uh, online database accessible to everyone uh, that shows all of the uh, historic determinations about a property. And it's very, uh, very, very useful, <laughs> I, I assume, for your work. So I'm going to set this up quickly. Property information map. So this is based on a Google map as the base, and Google uh, changes its base map frequently. Uh, but I 
one can enter an APN or an address or a street and uh, zoom to a location. I'm just picking the curvy part of Lombard Street for fun, um, just to show you some of the capabilities here. So th there's a range of tabs at the top. Great to know uh, what sort of complaints or building permits have been issued, uh, what, what the zoning district is. So there's a tremendous amount of information um, that's good to familiarize yourself with. And we're going to be looking at the preservation tab, uh, which I will click on, uh, and to see what types of historic information is available. So I'm not set on any property right now, but I'm going to turn on a few of these map buttons just to show what some of the information is. Uh, and I'll click on a few just to show what, see what shows up. Take this property. <laughs> Excellent, it's working. Uh, I'll go through a few of the tabs. It shows up as a category B, so it's a potential resource, which means it was constructed over uh, over 45 years ago. I'm looking through, it's not Article 10, it's not Article 11, it's not in a, a National Register District, uh, but I do see that it was included in a survey, a 1976 uh, survey, and the field form for that survey is also linked, and we can pull it up. So this is what it, the survey form looked like in 1976. There's often good information, um, views of a property, a uh, snapshot in time, and also often some fairly fun comments by the surveyors. But as I mentioned before, there's, there's 10,000 properties included in the 1976 architectural survey, and uh, it's not considered an adopted survey, so just because it's on the survey doesn't mean that it is a historic resource. It's automatically categorized as a, a non-resource, or sorry, as potential resource. I click on this uh, building right here, and this one, as we can see in the preservation tab, shows up as not a resource. Uh, I know it's more than 45 years old, so uh, there must have been a determination made at some point uh, about the, the building's uh, historic status. So I can see that it was included in the 1976 survey, so the survey field form, which I won't pop up. Uh, but I notice uh, going down that it also was in included a historic resource evaluation uh, response. So a, a property owner uh, applied to change this building in some way, triggered a historic resource evaluation, uh, and this historic resource evaluation resulted in a determination that the building is not a historic resource. Uh, even though it was included in the 1976 survey, and I took a look at this building last night, the photo of it, it's a great, or it was a, a great example of a Second Bay tradition building, architect design, very interesting and unusual. However, in the intervening a year since 1976, it's been altered significantly and to such a degree that it no longer can convey its significance. So I just clicked on the, the evaluations, historic resource evaluations are also linked, and uh, one can go through and see the justification for why it was determined to be a resource or to not be a resource. And I, I, I feel that my time to a close, and I think these are a couple good examples, um, I encourage you to use this map, um, turn on these uh, map buttons. Uh, you can get more information or get a sense of what's in an area, uh, what buildings are historic or if it's a historic district. There's also the Article 10, uh, all Article 10 properties are included uh, on this map. Um, but I think for the purpose of this discussion today, I will wrap it up on my next slide. If we could go back to Jonathan. So the, the property information map, again, it's publicly accessible. It's on the planning department's homepage, which is listed here. If you have questions, uh, there's sometimes the, the information is conflicting in the, the map or you're not able to figure it out. Planning department does uh, staff the Planning Information Center, which is a counter uh, next door at the uh, Department of Building Inspection. And planning department planners are there every day, all day, 
and you can stop by uh, to talk to a planner about a particular uh, issue, or you can also call, many people don't know that there's a planner working in the back, and you can call the telephone and just be prepared to wait for a while on hold, uh, but you can ask your question in that uh, manner, and that's usually the best way to get quick information. And the preservation planners of the department, we staff just two shifts a day, so in the morning or the afternoon, but you can come in in person or you can call. And I think that I should uh, <laughs> pass this on over to uh, William over at the OHP. Thank you, Marion. And I just wanted to let everybody know if you have to leave at, at a specified time, this, I know this was scheduled to end at 1130. Um, I'm going to let it run past 1130, but you're more than welcome to leave and watch the recording. Uh, everybody here will get a recording of the session. So right now I'm going to pull up William's uh, presentation. And I'm going to unmute William. And you're ready to go. Oh, good morning. Thank you. Were we going to do the, the survey again first, or should I just launch into the um, I, I could pull it up again, uh, and while I'm doing it, you can start uh, your uh, begin speaking, I guess. All right. Well, my name is William Berg. I work in the registration unit of California's Office of Historic Preservation. Um, I'm part of a three-person team that reviews National Register, California Register, California Historical Landmark, and Points of Historical Interest nominations for the entire state, and have been asked to talk about what are the effects of designation. It's one of the most common questions we get from the general public, and we very often uh, get calls from realtors asking about specific properties or what are some of the effects of designation. So uh, a lot of the talk I'm giving today is based on uh, feedback that I've gotten from realtors and questions that I've gotten from the general public, including people who, who want to know about this subject. Uh, just taking a look here, it looks like limitations on what an owner can do to the property is by far the biggest issue that people have, and as well as maintenance costs. So uh, if we can, once the poll comes down, we can go ahead and progress with the presentation. And uh, William, I will mention people do uh, think that you're a bit too quiet, but I think the solution for everybody is to please turn up your volume on your computer or your phone um, if you are able to. I'll try to come uh, closer to the microphone. Yeah, is I think it's it almost a little better, but it's, uh, it's still pretty quiet. So I think the solution for most people is just to turn up their volume. Um, I know that mine is set pretty low and I can hear them quite well, so it may depend on their device. All right. Well, uh, as I said, there are four different programs that we run through this office. Uh, some of them are very similar. The California Historical Landmarks, if you've seen the bare plaques throughout the state, the bronze ones, uh, there are many in the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, those use different criteria than the other two. Points of historical interest are more of a local version of the landmarks program. but all of them result in addition to the California Register of Historical Resources, which is uh, kind of intended as a catch-all list for historic properties that are identified via any state program or federal program. Properties that are listed in the National Register are automatically added to the California Register, as well as properties that are determined eligible. We'll go into that later. Uh, one thing I did want to address is level of significance. Very often people will assume that properties listed in the National Register can only uh, be listed if they really are of significance to the entire nation. But 90% are locally significant properties. So very often the same kind of properties that are listed locally can also be listed in the National Register. The, the threshold of significance, its role in the community uh, is about the same. Very often there may be a difference in level of documentation or specific requirements. Uh, some cities in California have no sort of local listing program and others have uh, a higher bar than the National Register. They require the properties to be older than the general 50-year rule for National Register properties or California Register properties. But in terms of the level of protection, uh, uh, they're all basically equal. Uh, the difference is that 
uh, how the property is assessed. Uh, statewide significance means a property that influenced the, the story of the entire state, and national significance means something that influenced the entire nation. It's harder to demonstrate, but very often people will want to include that in an option nomination because they want to share the story of the property. And there's also, there was a federal program that's not currently funded that was only eligible for properties of the national level of significance, which like I said, even 99% of the properties listed in the National Register don't qualify for. Uh, these are just a couple San Francisco examples. Uh, Temple Sharif Israel uh, was, made, uh, was significant both for its architecture and that it was designed to uh, it just kind of accidentally to withstand earthquakes. It's a box on top of a steel frame, and it was also used as a courthouse after the 1906 earthquake, and uh, so it played multiple roles. So it's very, very significant to the history of San Francisco, but it was primarily of local significance. Uh, the California Register and the National Register work kind of similarly in parallel, and there really isn't that much difference in terms of the criteria for each. California Register is numbered, um, the, the criteria are numbered, while National Register are lettered. There are some minor differences, but the first thing to know is, is that anyone can submit a National Register or California Register nomination. That doesn't mean that it's something you can write up over a weekend and send in. It still requires that the property meet the applicable criteria, that a level of documentation is done, that it can demonstrate its significance and its integrity, photographs are required, and as much documentation as possible. So it, it, it is a project for anyone, but anyone can do it. You don't have to be the owner. You don't have to live there. You don't have to have an advanced degree or a specific set of qualifications. In the case of California Register nominations, it's required that the nomination be sent to the local government via registered mail first and then wait 90 days for the local government to respond back to the applicant. Then they send the nomination and the registered mail certificate to our office where it's reviewed by staff. Now, these nominations are reviewed by the State Historical Resources Commission who meet every 90 days. So it's a bare minimum 90-day cycle for an item to be placed on the agenda and then reviewed by the commission. And that's assuming that it comes in in perfect shape, no revisions need to be done, and there's no backlog. As I said, there are only three staff for the entire state of California. So if we're receiving a lot of traffic, a lot of nominations, the property may not be reviewed immediately. Uh, the one thing that happens with California Register is there's a 90-day wait on, on the beginning, but as soon as it's reviewed by the commission, if they vote in support, it's immediately listed in the California Register. National Register, on the other hand, you don't have to delay or send it to local government. You can send it immediately to our office, but the middle portion works the same. It is reviewed by staff, and once it's ready, it's placed on the agenda for the State Historical Resources Commission. Um, and then once they vote, then essentially all they're doing is adding a recommendation. Then it's sent to the keeper, National Park Service, and generally you have to wait about 45 days for the keeper to make a decision. And as I said, once it's listed in the National Register, it is automatically added in to the California Register. I'm not sure what's wrong with the microphone. I tried turning up the, the volume here. I'm speaking as loud as I can, and I'm two inches from the microphone. William, I think a lot of people can hear you. Can I can hear you fine. Yeah, no, I, I can right. hear you fine. All I think right. some people, their volume it's settings fine. may be low or they're unable to hear because their computer doesn't have loud enough speakers. Um, so uh, just so everybody knows, this recording will be available. It might be easier to listen to the recording if you're having sound issues right now. But for those of you, uh, most people, it seems to be working fine for. All right. One thing I wanted to mention, because it sounds like it's particularly applicable to San Francisco, is what's called determination of eligibility. And this is not a listing in the National Register, but for one of several reasons, the property was determined to be eligible. Now, this can be something that happens because of what's called Section 106 review, environmental review. The original idea of the National Register was not to limit private property owner action, and actually listing the National Register in and of itself doesn't limit what private property owners can do to a property in any way. 
But if a government is going to do something that might affect a historic resource, whether or not it's ever been surveyed, whether or not it's listed in the National Register, they're still required to ask the question, is this going to affect a, a potentially eligible historic property? And if so, then they can that property can receive what's called a formal determination of eligibility for listing in the National Register, and that automatically puts the property in the California Register. That means that in the city of San Francisco, because it's California Register listed or has the DOE, it's treated as a historic resource, as was mentioned. A property can also receive a determination of eligibility if a person submits a nomination for a property and the private property owner objects. Uh, private property owners actually have more rights than governments when it comes to National Register listing. A private property owner can just send a registered mail or a, a, a notarized objection to listing and it cannot be listed in the National Register over their objection. The same goes for a California Register nomination. The main difference is that if a property owner objects to National Register listing, it can still be determined eligible but not listed in the National Register, but that determination of eligibility results in listing in the California Register. One recent example in San Francisco was the Sacred Heart Church. The owner objected, but it was determined eligible. Uh, essentially, they have the right just to say, we don't want this listed, but they can't say it doesn't qualify. Uh, one difference there is it, it, in the case of governments, uh, North Beach Public Library is another recent example. Government-owned buildings uh, work a little bit differently because the purpose of the National Register is to limit government's effects on private property. They can't just outright say, well, we don't want this listed. Uh, they can object. They can say, this is why we don't think the property qualifies, just as a private property owner can. And if they make the case that it's not eligible, then the National, Reg the National Park Service may not find it eligible. But the idea is that this gives the citizen the right to step up to protect publicly owned historic buildings. Uh, what the limitations are is primarily for people who are pursuing public funds. So public funded projects are going to be subject to environmental review. They're going to ask how this is going to affect the historic property. So something that's funded by stimulus funds, something that's fund, funded by HUNS or, or HUD or Department of Energy, other federal agencies, if they're providing money, if it's going to result in damage to a historic property, that can jeopardize those funds. And it uh, sounds like the city of San Francisco limits what uh, people can do with listed properties, they, they, but that varies widely by municipality. Some cities have no rules. Many cities don't automatically place National Register or California Register properties uh, in their local listings, uh, but it does happen once in a while. And often, if a property is National Register listed, then a, a local person can say to that city government, well, uh, if it's listed in the National Register, why doesn't, isn't it considered significant locally? I did want to also address the issue of historic integrity. This is the only property in the presentation that isn't actually in the city of San Francisco. It's just south. It's a roundhouse, kind of in an open field, and it's not in very good shape. And a property can be listed if it's in pretty rough shape. The idea is that it's a preliminary step for people who are trying to bring attention to a property or people who are trying to qualify for some kind of public funds or tax credits in order to rehab the property. All it needs is a sig significant amount of surviving integrity, uh, which doesn't have to mean it's in great shape, but just relatively intact. And it does not have to be something that's architecturally significant. As we saw, uh, the properties can be nominated because they're significant to the general patterns of history or associations with individuals significant to our past, even if they're not grand architectural landmarks. Uh, there are some state and federal in incentives. One that's uh, very commonly used, can be used throughout the state, is the California Historic Building Code. And I think there are gonna, there's going to be a future presentation on that. But the idea is that if uh, it would damage a historic building to bring it up to modern building code, there are limited exemptions to contemporary building code. And the idea there is you can actually save money in rehabbing a building if you don't have to change the historic staircase out to meet the way the modern stairs are built. The, there's still always 
uh, an emphasis leaning towards access and safety, especially for public buildings, but it does create some opportunities to simplify restoring a historic house. And that's available to any building in the state as long as it's listed as a historic property somewhere, National Register, California Register, or local listings. Uh, there's also the Federal Tax Credit Program, which is a federal program, and it actually allows someone doing a large rehab program to claim 20% of the cost of the rehab and write it off their taxes. And the problem with it is that it's not the easiest program to get involved with. It does involve a lot of money. In California, I think last year, was something like $300 million worth of tax credits were obtained, but it's typically because it was large projects, such as Union Iron Works. If you're a San Franciscan, you, I'm sure you, you're paying attention to what's happening there. That's going to be a massive development, including housing, commercial, mixed use, but it's, it's a big money project. And generally, properties have to be kind of large in order to do the federal tax credit. So one thing that's coming up, and I think is going to be the subject of a further, further feature presentation, is the California Historic Preservation Tax Credit that's still running through the assembly right now. But if it happens, it will be a tax credit program that will be available for smaller projects, for individual homeowners, whereas the federal tax credit is only for commercial properties or things like a condo project. It's still going to kind of be determined how that's going to work out, but it is on the horizon and it is going to become a bigger thing. Uh, and then one other issue, I, I don't have the full details on it, but historic properties, especially National Register listed properties, very often will get higher consideration in terms of FEMA assistance and funds in the case of natural, natural disasters. When there was an earthquake up in Hobart County a few years ago, we got calls directly from from FEMA folks wanting to know where the historic resources were in the area affected by the earthquake. And in San Francisco, that's certainly something people take into consideration. Uh, now, it sounds like San Francisco has a really good comprehensive database of properties within San Francisco, including National Registered California Register listed properties. So that would be the go-to point. Uh, I, I'm sorry to say it. But California Office of Historic Preservation's web, web page does not have a definitive or authoritative source of California properties on it. Uh, we're working on it, but as you may have heard, the state of California has been running into some issues lately, and we're still playing catch up. We hope to have something uh, along those lines in the, in the future, but it, it's not quite ready for prime time. In the meantime, one other resource is the National Park Service Focus Database. I'll have the, uh, the link later on in the presentation. And that allows people to look up any National Register listed property in the country. And you, you can actually review the original nomination forms. Uh, they don't have all of them scanned yet, but NPS is a, is a really good resource for National Register properties uh, of all sorts, including many in the city of San Francisco. If you're really looking for an exhaustive database of properties that have been surveyed, including stuff that may not even be captured by the city of San Francisco and certainly is not something you'd find online, uh, there, is what, there are a series of information centers throughout the state of California. And for the Bay Area, that information center is the Northwest Information Center at Sonoma State University. Uh, this is the, the contact information for their coordinator and for their staff. And as you can see, most of Northwestern California is covered by that information center all the way down into the, uh, the Monterey Bay area. And uh, the Mutual Savings Bank here is actually it's a, it's a tax credit project. And both the uh, older building in the middle there and also the postmodern addition from about 1965 on the right were considered part of the historic property. Uh, one thing that uh, I think it was pointed out in the last presentation, historic preservation is a moving target. It doesn't just apply to 100-year-old buildings, but uh, as people are moving, as buildings become 50 years or older, they're all eligible for consideration. And so more contemporary architectural styles are definitely included in what we're trying to capture. Um, there's a lot of questions about the effects of property values on that, that happened with historic buildings. And there was a fairly recent study that's done in 2008 by the city of Rockford, Illinois. And what they found is that historic properties and historic districts stabilizes the valuation of a neighborhood. It's less subject to dynamic increase 
uh, like say in a market boom because the property is no longer available for say conversion to high rises or other uh, high return investments but it's also less likely to decrease during economic crashes. It's, it, in a lot of ways, it, a historic property or historic resource is kind of like the equivalent of a blue chip stock versus a dot com stock. You, you're gonna make less money on the top end, but it's less likely to crash and burn. And uh, what they found is assessed valuation in the neighborhood increased more in historic districts and lost less over a 30-year period. So generally, they didn't, they, they didn't drop as much as non-historic districts during periods of crashes, and they gained a little bit more overall in the aggregate. Uh, they also tend to be owner-occupied properties. You find more ownership housing in historic districts and that, that actually results in neighborhood stability. And homeowners, single family homeowners, they're looking for a neighborhood that's going to be stable, where they're gonna get a sense that I'm moving in here, I'm taking a 30 year mortgage, I wanna be here for a long time. And if I moved into this neighborhood because I like it, I like the features, the way it looks, the way it's laid out, that it's not going to see a whole lot of dramatic change in the near future. And the advantage of a historic district and why people very often will look for them is because of that sense of neighborhood stability and continuity over time. There's also a very recent report, it just came out last week, the National Trust uh, is, is actually, it's called Older, Smaller, Better. And it was a survey of several cities, including San Francisco, that talked about what are the economic effects of historic buildings, not just historic buildings, but just plain regular old buildings, whether or not they're listed. And what this report found is that generally they're more walkable. Uh, they have a higher walk score and transit score. Very often real estate listings, people are looking for walkable neighborhoods, bikeable neighborhoods. They want to be able to leave their car at home or not own one at all. And historic districts and uh, neighborhoods that include historic properties tend to have those higher walk scores because they were designed for people who walked or took transit instead of driving. Nightlife is more alive on streets with a diverse range of building ages. The study in San Francisco found that blocks where there were mixed vintage buildings in commercial districts had more cell phone activity on the weekends. That means more young people are there and they're posting to Instagram of the great party they're having. Uh, these older business districts, they also provide more affordable and flexible space for entrepreneurs from all backgrounds. That includes everything from small local businesses to dot-com startups. The creative economy thrives in older mixed-use buildings. They create more jobs per square foot, and they're more localized. The older buildings tend to include more local businesses rather than national chain businesses. I know that's another uh, serious issue for a lot of neighborhoods in San Francisco where neighborhood advocacy has resulted in, in strong limitations on chain businesses. The advantage of a historic property, what draws people to those neighborhoods, is that a uh, local historic space is far better suited for a local business to open than a chain. And these older commercial and mixed-use districts contain hidden density. They, they may only be a couple of stories tall, but the population density is very high because of higher utilization of space. And it's deceiving, but that population density means more foot traffic, more economic activity, and more walkability. All of these essentially mean that in, in addition to kind of the, the more conservative profile of the homeowner is looking for stability, the, uh, the up and coming profile of young people are more interested in historic spaces and they, in the long run, these are the places that people just sort of instinctively like. And the nice thing about this new study is that it's providing some numbers and some concrete evidence, some big data documentation that backs up what people are just have just sort of instinctively known with some hard data. And as I said, there's, uh, there is a historic property customer. There is a profile. They tend to value the aesthetics of buildings, so that can mean everything from, from wealthy people who are uh, collectors and interested in uh, historic properties or old things to young artists who want a, an environment that's stimulating, that's interesting, that's visually engaging. And they tend to not just want their building to look good, but the neighborhoods around it. You know, my building is beautiful and the other neighborhoods in the building are beautiful. 
Uh, there also is a lot of interest in people who are interested in green building, the environmental effect of de demolishing old buildings and build building new buildings is enormous. About half of our landfills are either construction, waste, or old building debris. And older buildings can be extraordinarily energy efficient. So that's another potential customer for historic properties. And then, of course, uh, anybody who watches a lot of home improvement shows knows there's a whole market for fixers and flippers, people who want to fix up an old property for their own place or as an investment that they can then sell. And then, of course, there's a market for people who don't want to fix houses. They want to buy something that's, that's been repaired from one of these people. So there's a market for them, too. So there are multiple groups of people who are specifically looking for a historic house. And if a property is listed, then they know up front that it's the kind of thing they're looking for. So if you're marketing to this population, knowing that the property is locally listed, that's listed in the National Register and the California Register, uh, is positive appeal. And the fact that they have to take care of and maintain that property is a relatively minor consideration because that's what they're looking for. Okay, William, yeah, are, I, I assuming you're. Uh, oh, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. I'm assuming this is your last slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just going to mention we will provide each of these links in due course. So I'll probably send them by the end of the day to everybody who registered. Um, so you'll have access to the property maps that uh, Mary presented, as well as the links that uh, William uh, mentioned through in the course of his presentation. Um, it looks like we have a number of questions, so I'm going to try to move quickly into them. Uh, and at this point, I'm also going to unmute uh, Mary if she's still in the room so she can answer um, any questions. Uh, um, so both speakers are now unmuted. Um, and uh, for the people that are asking questions now in the chat, I'll take these up after the ones that I've collected uh, in the course of both presentations. Um, uh, the first question is actually coming from... Uh, Val, um, and uh, Val is asking what uh, an owner can do when they disagree with being designated a historical resource without spending a fortune in attorney's fees. Um, and Mary, did you want to address that? or? Sure. So it, it depends. If, if you're talking about an Article 10 or Article 11 landmark, it, that's a historic resource. And if they disagree, they would need to uh, have the Board of Supervisors introduce legislation that they adopted and that the mayor would sign off on saying that they're not a historic resource and they're not an Article 10 or 11 property. So that seems fairly unlikely. However, if it was a property that was surveyed, for example, uh, in the 1968 Here Today a survey, there's a book, those are automatically all categorized as uh, CEQA Category A, which is a known resource. Uh, but that survey was 40 years ago, and maybe in the meantime, a property has uh, been altered to such a degree that it no longer retains its, its significance or, or conveys um, why it was a resource or it no longer has integrity. So in those cases, a property owner could hire a consultant uh, or if they are able to do it themselves, create, uh, submit a historic resource evaluation report documenting uh, the building's history and also alteration history uh, with uh, some rationale on why it would, it would not qualify any longer as a historic resource. Uh, but these, there's very specific uh, criteria for significance uh, that the planning department and most municipalities follow uh, based on the uh, National Park Service uh, criteria for significance as well as seven different aspects of integrity uh, in order to to meet the, the, the minimum standards for uh, being identified as a historic resource. That's the short okay. answer. <laughs> Did you have anything to add, William? In the case of National Register or California Register nominations, if an owner, if a property is nominated, the owner is notified when the nomination is received, and they're nominated, they're notified again when the nomination is going to be reviewed by the commission. All they have to do if they want to object to prevent the property from being listed, is to send a notarized letter of objection to saying, I object. It costs $20 or so to, to have a letter notarized. And that's it. It cannot be listed over their objection. Uh, the one difference there is that if, if, if it's already been listed, they can't just get it unlisted. 
uh, nor can they prevent it from being determined eligible any more than someone who is over 50 years old can have a lawyer make the case that they're actually under 50 years old. Either it's eligible or it's not, but it can't be listed over that formal objection, and that only costs about 20 bucks and a stamp. Okay. Um, and I think there's a, somewhat of a related question uh, from Anna. She's asking if a buyer purchases a property that is more than 45 years old but has not yet been evaluated, what if they plan to do, uh, to do work? Is it possible during the permitting process that they would then be evaluated and denied permits due to historic significance? Okay, that's a very good question, and it's a question that we answer quite a bit at the Planning Information Center. So what she's talking about is what would be a CEQA Category B building, that it's a potential resource, uh, but it's not known whether it is a resource or not a resource. Uh, and if it's an alteration that is that would meet uh, the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, which Tim Fry, my colleague, will talk about more in an upcoming webinar, if it's a, an alteration that's compatible uh, with the design of the building or an alteration that's very minimally visible, not at the primary facade or if it's interior work, uh, then uh, the permit would, would likely be approved with basic um, environmental review. Uh, however, if it's an alteration that's pretty substantial, if it impacts the front of the facade, or if it's a, a very large addition, uh, and it would have the, the potential to impact what is a potential historic resource, uh, then the, res the, the building is treated as if it's a historic resource until it's determined that it's not a resource. Uh, so typically, uh, applicants will come to the Planning Information Center with ideas on a project that they, they want to add an addition, and what do they what do they need to do in order to get it um, easily approved or without triggering any historic uh, special historic review? And typically, an addition, for example, would uh, if it was set back a certain distance, maybe 15 or 20 feet, so it was less visible from the street for example, uh, or if the materials and the finishes were very compatible with the design, then even though if the building's uh, actual uh, historic status is not known, uh, the alteration uh, would, wouldn't impact the building, therefore it could be approved. So people often work closely with the planners at PIC uh, to create a design that's compatible and that could be approved. However, there are cases where uh, an applicant comes in and it's a, it's a Category B building that's not known, and they, they want to do uh, a project, uh, and it would, it would not meet the Secretary of the Interior standards, and therefore they uh, would be triggered for a historic resource evaluation uh, to determine whether or not the property is a, is a resource, uh, and if it is a resource, would the proposed alteration impact that resource? So there is a, a separate process of historic resource evaluations. Uh, I showed one on the property information map that, that resulted in a non-resource determination. And you can look through the property information map and get examples uh, of these historic resource evaluations. But there's definitely a fee and a wait time uh, to, to get a determination as to a building's historic status. Okay, great. And and a, a number of questions came up asking how many properties are Category C, how do we know whether properties have been evaluated, and how would we know if a property is historic? Um, and most of these questions were somewhat addressed in the course of the presentation, but I guess it might be a good idea to repeat that a lot of this information is probably available on the property information map that you presented, right, Mary? In that, in that case, I would send everybody the link and they could look up the property and see um, whether Correct. it's designated. Correct. Um, they can do that. And when, with the Category C, I don't know offhand how many are Category Cs. It'd be everything that's either not yet uh, 45 years old or has been determined not to be a resource in a survey, in a large-scale survey effort, or in this historic resource evaluation process I just described. But just a heads up, uh, for properties that go through the historic resource evaluation process, uh, many of these processes, and I believe most, are determined not to be historic resources. Uh, but this process is to create uh, open and objective and transparent uh, documentation as to why a property is or is not a, a historic resource. Okay, and while I take up the next question, I'm going to briefly show the evaluation page, but we'll continue to take some of these questions. 
Um, okay, so the next question was, uh, I think this is probably more directed towards uh, Mary, but um, it's coming from Allison. She's wondering uh, if designations would appear on a title report. So I'm not familiar with title reports, but uh, most or they most of the local, the Article 10 and 11, we do produce a notice of special restrictions, and that's generally found in the property information map. Uh, and that, that's only for the uh, Article 10 and 11. I don't know if those show up in the title report. Uh, however, title report rep preparers, I, I don't remember their exact <laughs> uh, the title of that profession, but they call the uh, Planning Information Center all the time to find out what the historic status is of a building. So I assume that's included in the title report. Uh, but from my understanding, the National Register, um, that type of information or el survey eligibility would not be included. Okay. Um. I think the only final question is, um, oh, there was one that came up that asked if there were any property tax benefits to being designated a historic property. William sort of touched on those, um, but we also, in part four of this uh, series, uh, will cover in great detail the financial incentives of owning or buying a historic property. And uh, you'll learn more, more about the Mills Act and other property tax benefits that are available to San Francisco residents. Um, but the other question was if uh, Val is asking, are interiors on, uh, covered only on public buildings? And uh, I think that's a good point to bring up, Mary, is um, the interiors of buildings, uh, when you mentioned it, you were only talking about residential, right? Right. So for this is specifically for Articles 10 and 11. The interiors, uh, if it's covered uh, by the landmark designation, it would be included in the landmark designation report very explicitly, so, you, so one would know exactly which features uh, should be protected and preserved in this process. Uh, so theaters, auditoriums, uh, those school auditoriums, those are uh, often included in landmark designation reports. Uh, apartment lobbies are often included as well. Okay, um, I'm going to quickly, I, I know I brought up the evaluation page, uh, give me two seconds, I want to step away from this page briefly, I'll tell you more about it later, but um, hopefully people aren't, uh, if you're typing something in the evaluation right now, just uh, hold on one second, I just want to make sure that there were no more questions on the chat box. And it looks like, looks like, um, we don't uh, we don't uh, have any more questions. Um, it looks like CJ is typing something. Um, I'll wait one second just to be sure that that's not a question. Um, if not, uh, you're more than welcome to email or or uh, write one of us, and we'll direct the question to the right person. Or you can visit the um, information center at the planning department. Um, so what I'll do right now, and looks like we're about to end right on time. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, please do give us the feedback. Uh, in order to do this, you'll have to answer these multiple choice responses, then scroll back up to the top of the page and hit the submit response button. Um, if you don't do that, we won't receive your response. Also on the bottom of the page, um, we'd like to hear what you'd like to see in future programs. We're planning on continuing this next year, possibly. So if you think there's a particular topic you'd like to learn more about, um, we will take it into account and probably include it in the next program. And uh, we'd like to learn why you took the course. Um, but I, I just wanted to uh, second my thanks and th say also say thank you to both of our speakers, Mary Brown and William Berg. Um, please remember that the second of the four modules in this series will be presented on Thursday, the 5th of June at 10 a.m. If you are unable to attend, you will have the opportunity to watch a recording and complete a short quiz. Uh, for those that attend live, they are uh, not required to complete the quiz. And I also wanted to say congratulations to everybody. Uh, you are now one-fourth of the way through receiving your certification. Um, thanks again for your advice, input. Thanks for the speakers. And um, I will see you all on the 5th of June.